What's your favorite script that you've written? I know it's like asking what your favorite child is of your children, but. but of ours or just in general? Of yours. Of ours. Parenthood, you know, it was very personal. Right. You know, everybody, Bob Lou and I and Ron and Brian Gray is the producer, we, we, we were all. We were living it. Yeah, we, we, we were stealing from our lives in a. In a you feel that, that when you watch it, it's just so wonderfully authentic and emotional yeah. and funny. That's yeah, great, because your kids go, was that us? Was that you? No, no, it's Lowell's daughter. That is, no, that's you. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, and my, my, my son's wife now we talk about the movie, it, it, you know, it turned to, to Scott, my son said, is that what you were like, you know, something. And so uh, that, that movie just uh, meant a lot to all of us. What's your favorite line and scene that you've written? I always liked, again, maybe just because I'm stuck on parent, I always liked the scene between uh, Steve and Mr. Robards at the, at the ball game, the one that we that we beg Ron to keep in the movie. Yeah. You, you're never done, you, you, you never get to do your, your touchdown, touchdown dance. dance. <laughs> um, and, and I think probably it looms large, because of all the movies we did with Ron, it was the only- Please indulge the writers. It was the only time we ever asked him not to cut something. Because we, we're usually the most vicious about cutting our own material. Scenes, jokes, the, the slightest negative reaction, or get rid of it, get it out, we don't want it there anymore. And what was, what was making you feel so strongly about that moment? I, I, we both felt like that scene sort of encompassed the reason that we had wanted to do the movie. Exactly. Um, and what was great is there was, well, I can't remember last year they had a tribute for Steve Martin, and that was the clip they showed, and you go, all right. See, it stayed in, that was good. That was, yeah. That was good that it stayed. But Ron, Ron was, was wonderful, because he turned to the editors, they had a beautiful cut that eliminated that scene. I mean, it was really artistic. And he turned to the editors, who were great guys, and he said, uh, I've, I've done uh, four movies with these guys, this is the first time they've ever asked me not to cut something. We're going to leave it in. Oh, that's that's the mark of a nice collaboration. Yeah, yeah, and, and, uh, and so we I, haven't worked since. <laughs> <laughs> we yes, we did Ed TV. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so th that was certainly one. But I mean, there were you know a lot that, a lot of them. Do you guys like to read other writers around town, or, or are there any? You mean just in general to pick in, up a screenplay and read it? In general, yeah. We've never done that. No. You're not missing much. Somebody asks us to oh, read, would you, would you read us as a favor? As give a us favor notes? to, yeah, like, absolutely. you know, for help, yes. But no, we, I, don't, I, don't, I really don't want to read what's going on in anybody else's head. Now, where did the idea for Splash come from? Mr. Brian Grazer. Brian, Brian Grazer. Mr. Brian Grazer himself. So he's an immensely wealthy man today. He has ideas. He, it, 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 it occurred to him, it was the kind of idea I, I would never come, I don't, do you, would this it ever have occurred to you? This was the movie. Everybody's wife said, "Do it." How do the wives feel about the prostitution ring in the in the uh, morgue? That they um, we well, weren't there. Oh, my father-in-law went to the set once when they were uh, the lady, young ladies were. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't allowed. Well, they, they would just you know everybody. That's your first movies. Everybody's right. just so kind of excited. Energy, I mean, yeah. there's, there's nothing. There's nothing like it. I mean, we've done a lot of movies to to sit at those test screenings on the first. Good. I'm not a cynic. But everything after the first time is, is different. There, there was something about hearing the audience crack open on a, on a joke, the night show, and, and like the second or third time when you knew that always gets a laugh and you could just kind of sit there and say to yourself, here it comes, here it comes, and then it did. And then from that point on, it, it's, um, it, it's something else. It's not, it's not bad. It's not like, oh, we don't care anymore. But the, well, was, the night shift was special. It was also know? great because the, the studio was a little anxious about Michael. He was a little over the top. But we, they wanted to fire him this, the first week of shooting. But we just, no. Because we, there was a search to find that Bill Blaze job. That's that. amazing. It was the most depressing thing I've ever been involved he with. He created kind of a, a new genre for Oh, he was, he was spectacular. He was spectacular in that movie. We would movie. go to, to, to Ron Howard's house how many nights just to watch audition? To look at audition tapes? Did he, come out, of, just, weeks? Did he come out of auditions? Just no, no. We had seen him on TV and we suggested he was in, him. He was in an episode of the Tony Randall show where he, it was Ed's, Ed's, Ed's Law School, yes, I think. It was that's Ed's right. Law School. That's right. And at night, he, the judge would, would earn some extra money and would go to this law, and he was one of, one of the students. This no, cheap ass had no law right school. Yeah, and he, and was just this, he was just this goof ass. And, and, we, and finally, after they had tested like everybody in the world, I think we just said, bring in this kid that, that we saw. And, and it was like, 
they, they showed that tape. Babalu ran from where we were sitting and hugged the this TV is, that they true. were playing the tape on. Because he actually, after seeing weeks. And because weeks. we had seen a hundred tapes by that. He just he actually actually embraced the set. And and he, you know, and you heard of it, he was great. And he actually frightened the studio. If, you, if you've ever seen Night Shift, there's the, the subway scene. Well, you're Hell like, brokers, yeah. right? And he comes, at, and at Daly's, the, the people at, at Warner Bros. actually went, nah! <laughs> you know, it was like that kind of moment. And, and uh, Ron just said, no, no, it's fine. It, you know, it was Ron's first studio movie. Either. We didn't have, nobody had any weight to throw around. Uh, not that that's how Ron operates anyway, but, you know, he just said, no, no, it'll be fine. And he was, you know, he, he, he was just tremendous, Michael. Now I want to discuss uh, a scene you guys have cited as a particularly strong um, example of your work. It's the scene in the League of Their Own where Tom Hanks ranks out Evelyn for a mistake she made on the uh, field. The catchphrase scene. A justifiably oh. classic rant yeah, that's now that's scene. now yeah. was in every TV spot and every trail. Yes, my wife wants me to get it and try to get it in Bartlett's. She keeps saying, "Be call, find out how you get something in Bartlett's." What was the genesis of that rant he gives? Was was that something you just kind of wrote in the first draft and was always there? It was always there. It was always there, and and the the good thing about it is we did not set out to write a catchphrase, you exactly. know, to, to write a to get something that would be on on T-shirts. It absolutely came out of who he was, of character. You just you you you're writing a scene to show how mismatched he is in this world and how how stunned and astounded he is that he could yell at a ball player and the ball player would cry that that, that was just you know, he, was, he, he was a pig but he was passionate about the sport yes. okay so the fact that she was a woman it was just the fact that she screwed up a play yes and then he was not yelling a, at her as a woman he was yelling at her as a ball player the same way he had been yelled at when he was a ball player and and his the the fact that then she would cry just 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 crystallized for him everything that was wrong about this circumstance that he had found himself in. Then you throw in the brilliance of an actor because you don't write Evelyn yeah. when he it's does thing, this it's thing and you see yeah. and I remember Daly's and you just go a gentleman is doing this and you're laughing hard. Yeah, and you just went, boy, this is now three times funnier than it was on the page because he had just. He just embodied it. It had just his become, head was going to explode. Yeah, he really he really looked like 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 a cartoon. Like smoke was going to come out of his ears in a Warner Brothers cartoon. You know, he he was. Yeah. Uh, it's one of know. those moments where his delivery of "There's no crying in baseball." Yeah, yeah, is responsible for someone in like Nebraska saying "There's no crying at the car wash." There's no yeah, crying. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. being used for everything. Yeah. But uh, but I say what, what we like about it is that that line came out and it came just completely it, it really was in it really was born of the moment not of trying and of the character yeah not trying to be clever you know going what what would be a clever she thing she started to say crying here. so it came out of story and character it but came out of, absolutely she started are you crying and then yeah it's a whole he, world he was just he was genuinely astonished that that somebody in a baseball game would cry. It just it, it just wouldn't compute for him. Did you know it would play as, as big and funny as it did? No, no, never. No. Yeah, so he had just he had just lifted it to a place that uh, that you and know. Then the callback scene where he is trying to contain his yes. anger and he's trying to repress it. And yes, he's become a more modern man. Yeah. You know, by, by, and he's by almost the trembling. And he's just and <laughs> Tom is still he's you're, doing you're missing the but you're. The, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> you know, right. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. he's he, great. Well, he was great. Yeah. Do you test style? I mean, you mentioned you kind of uh, bounce off each other verbally as you're writing. Do you test out different dialogue uh, when you're bouncing around a scene like that? Yeah. I mean, we, we always do. We, we, and we, um, I guess in some sense, it's kind of, I don't know if it's old fashioned or not. I don't know what you'd call it, but the exact, the exact geometry of a joke. I mean, we will say it and then say it with different syllables in it and keep saying it and then we'll put away write it and the next day we read the material out loud. See that's always the out loud. Of the handwriting process. We give it to Rose, our assistant, and the next day these fresh pages it come. It comes in. back typed so it's, it's like, like new. Pixies wrote them. Yeah. And and and, and now you're just reading it always out loud and you 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 hear the sound the jokes made. Then you hire actors, and it makes a different sound. 
uh, not because they're monkeying with it. It's just the, the joke has a different DNA when it's not being, you know, said by two guys from the Bronx. Um, I don't know if you noticed an accent at any point. But, um, and we will, we will rework the jokes just to get, because we're still trying to hear the, 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 the pitch of it. You know, we want it to ring. Did Hank's uh, improv line about an umpire being looking like a penis with a little hat on, or was that you guys from the beginning, too? No, no, as a matter of fact, he thought the joke was something else at first. He yes. thought that the joke was, do you know you look like a penis with that little hat on? That the, well, wearing the little hat made him look like a penis. So he had said, no, we, what we meant was, you know, you look like a penis with a hat on, with a little hat on, you know, that, that, that was, oh, oh, okay. And then he, you know, then, then he knocked it out of the park as he pretty much always does. Was the Rogers Hornsby anecdote based on anything real? It was based... It was Jimmy Fox? Who it, it, the character's based on? The character was based loosely on Jimmy Fox, but I had years and years and years ago read a, a book, uh, Bill Veck's autobiography. Bill Veck was a guy who used to own the Indians and the White Sox, and he had a chapter in there about just how harsh uh, a man Rogers Hornsby was, and it just sort of stuck I had a, and we wanted him, you know, to say but what his, he, but, but the thing is, the humanizer, he says his parents came to visit him, so yes. Jimmy Dugan. Yes. And when Rogers Hornsby, he, he just cut him down to, no, I yeah. didn't cry. So. Right in front of my parents right who were driven down from me. Michigan to see yes. the game. You know, just, it just uh, we always try. We don't always succeed, but we always try to, to really, that our characters really have a life. They're not saying things because the script needs them to say something so that it can move on to the next line or the next piece of information. That, that Which is, which when we read spec scripts, that is the key of... of that, that's probably the biggest failing you read, is you, you'll just say to a young why is this character saying this? I know it has to get you to the next scene, but why... Why is, is he saying it? it? Goes why back does he to, want to it say it? It goes back to Jack Klugman. Yes. What, 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 what does he want? So, you know, we're, we're, we don't always succeed. No one does, but we, we always really... Trying to 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 have have everything come out of a very specific personal place, you know, specific, honest, and emotional, um, and rail. But every once in a while, uh, we you hit all three at the same time, and you know, and those are the best moments. And then when you get lucky that the audience and Convergence. They actually yeah. want to see it. Well, I know when I when I feel that trifecta in a in a movie, it just feels like you can relax or in the hands of a storyteller, and it's going somewhere, and it all makes sense. Yeah, I always felt like like in Parenthood specifically, where it where it went over, where we really thought it was just going to be a niche film, and it, it, it you know that it would never be like you know big summer grosses or anything like you know. But the the audience identified, even though probably none of those specific events took place in their in their life it had but they knew from the beginning you know from that opening montage when the little, the, the little kid that's and it was ron's moment was wrapped up on they had just come from the foot the baseball game and the kid was on where and he was looking for for the child and the child was wrapped and, and getting into a van and seat belt. everybody knew where we know where we are we, yeah they, the, right. the comfort and, and, zone and the only just even though they couldn't say yes that that specific thing happened with me right. and my family also it 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 felt True. Well, I don't even have children, but I love, I really related, I don't know why, but the scene where Steve Martin has his dark fantasy about his son ending up on the tower with a oh. rifle, <laughs> we're missing the ball, was just so, the my God, that, that's the genius. But the brilliance of Steve Martin, no kids, no nothing. We went down to Orlando. No, he, he could, never had kids. He couldn't identify children in a police lineup, okay? <laughs> yes. But he, you know, he, he, he somehow identified that character, the character he was playing, his anxieties, Right. He he related them to some other anxieties that he. I think it had to do with paintings. He pretended they were paintings. <laughs> <laughs> you know Never was, but you know he he was he was wonderful. Did you have to do a lot of research for a league of their own because it was based on historical events? Or do it's, you, it's probably the most research we've ever done on we any read movie. We a five thousand page thesis. Yeah, oh my god! Like it was like. It, and it, I think from it we've got maybe two. Th one of them, a young lady lived above the gym with her father. 
Yes, that's where we got uh, that from. That was Marla, great. That was, you know, who wasn't so attractive. Oh, that's that was, that was that was that was a great idea. A, a girl with no mother, just a dad, and his job was taking care of the field house, and they lived above the gym. And that was that scene. That was, we got that from uh, this history of women's baseball that this woman had written for a master's thesis. She was one of the players. This had been written. This had been written 50 years ago. Uh, this piece and somebody got it for us um, but no we we life magazine articles and stories we interviewed all and the, of the, doc all the, the documentary ladies. that documentary that, yeah. that, that that just you know but we hate research we hate research they wanted to send us up to montana for city slickers to go on one of those cattle drives i said right. we'll write the movie first call a guy who runs those things and we call and them say, and call him and say this is what we wrote. Could this happen? And he said, yeah, that could happen. We said, research. thank you. And oh, said, oh, my. <laughs> we're, we're looking for a plausible reality. We're looking for a possible reality that this could happen, that it, it does not break the bounds of any, of, you know, of any logical how humans might behave in a situation. We're, we're not trying to write the definitive kind of, uh, you know, project on what it's like to go on a fantasy cattle drive. No, all we, we, we care is that they brought in the herd by themselves. Yeah. If these events happen, would that... Would yes. You know, and you're just saying, if, 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 we think, how many people would go on it, so something, well, could it be fewer than that? Yeah, it could be fewer than that. Good, because we want it to be fewer than that. You know, and, and, right. and that, that's, that was our research. So not much, not much research on, on the other stuff for things like settings and context, just kind of stuff that comes out of your heads? Yeah. No, I mean, Splash, I think we went down to the vegetable market one morning. Yeah, we got up at 5. We got up at 5 a.m. and drove down to see the vegetable market. Night shift, we never visited a morgue. We just thought it'd be creepy, so right. we didn't go. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I, you know, it sounds like we don't care. We do. Like I say, we're always looking for, for plausible reality, You're not, not, not trying to recreate. Because uh, we're familiar with fruit. It's not a surprise. <laughs> it's not a secret. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Uh, we were just, but I think we were having a little trouble picturing it. Yeah. So we went down, you know, we, we just wanted to have a, a, a mental image when we were writing the scene. Besides, I was out of bananas. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. sir, I mean, masters. that'd be fresh down there. Right. Yeah. Someone else has a story credit on League of Their Own. Uh, does that uh, happen a lot with you guys in terms of do studios come with uh, ideas or, or source material that you take on and then kind of make your own? Studios or producers or directors or actors uh, come with us with notions sometimes, you know, and uh, we will, aha, uh -huh, go back to our office, generally just not do that, do, but when we do, it's because we, we will come back and say, if we were going to do this movie, this is how we would do it. Is that, is that appealing? Right. right. And if they say yes, we, you know, either they're so big the deal's already set up, or we then start to shop it around, you know, and, and, and try to get it, try to get it set up somewhere. So you're but, open to good ideas, whether they're your own or... Yeah, or and a, basically, who are we on this journey? Right. Well, what's our part? Well, who, who, who are our eyes? Right. Yeah. But I mean, we, we prefer somebody bringing us a notion because we, we're not salesmen. Right. We like the idea that somebody besides us is interested in this and will, you know, and, and, and will lead the blocking. Mm -hmm. I, we don't really want to convince the industry to make the, the movie that we've, uh, it, it's not a pleasant process. Right. What do you think makes the process unpleasant? It's just selling. I, we, we're not sales pits. It's not unpleasant for everybody. Right. There are people who like to... And we work with a lot of people. I mean, you know, the studio people are very nice to us. Oh, yeah. No, no. So I'm it's not, not saying like a that they're unpleasant. That, yeah. that just you, the process you, of selling or pitching sometimes can be unpleasant. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think the worst, though, is, is... Here's my stuff. You know, here's, right, here, right. Here, can, I, can I sell you a vegetable right, slice? Like a schmata salesman. I, yeah. I, I, not that there's anything... I don't feel like demeaned or right. anything. It's just not what we do. Right. We're just these sort of, you know, goofy, kind of nerdy guys right. who just don't have that salesman's kind of, right. you know, that's, moxie. That's where the Brian's of the world come in. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. we love those people. We don't, we don't, we don't mock and demean them. We, we love them. Well, I hope I didn't just mock and demean, but Brian, I didn't mock and demean no, you. No, no. <laughs>
just immediately blasted out of the chair. <laughs> out of the industry. Yeah. yeah. With, with uh, something like League, once uh, a very specific actress like Madonna's hired, did, was there any dialogue tinkering with a performer that specific uh, once she came on board? Or did, she, did she just do it as written? And, no, she and just did it as written. I, they just... Uh, they they just sort of extended her dance a little bit because she's so good at it. You know, there, there was always a piece where, you know, they go to this place and the girls would be dancing with guys, so they just, Penny just gave her kind of a little specialty piece because, you know, she's she's great, you know, so. Uh, but no, she, she, did, uh, she did the piece as written. Can you walk us through uh, the, the kind of development of a comic set piece? From, from any one of the movies, maybe Parenthood, because it's, it's so universal, universally relatable? Well, I don't know that we ever... I tell you one, we, 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 we did one the other day. We, Which... we, we, we're working on a script called Crazy, because I've been thinking about this. Uh -huh. a script we wrote 10 years ago that, that Brian Grazer actually had an idea and says, you know what, I think we, we, I, I've got a way to actually... Yeah, I think we can thing. breathe new life into it if you took it a, a And we've always loved life. the script, and so it's been languishing for 10 years. It's and always been a stone in our shoe that, it, that it's never been made. And it kind of dealt with, with you know, schizophrenia and acceptance, and, and, but they did Beautiful Minds, so they didn't want to do the subject so matter. So, that so element. we're rewriting it to, to, to lose that and make it just more of a Hollywood David and Goliath kind of romantic comedy. And there's a scene in there where we introduced, we introduced the movie star, and we introduced him funny, and it's, it's, it's bright, and it's, it's, it's a great way. What was left was the scene that introduced the, the old, David character. The old David the character. character. And he had been introduced kind of in an intriguing way in the old scene, because you had, you had sort of seen in a prologue his backstory of suffering through schizophrenia, and then you met him in the body of the piece, working at this kind of regular, mundane sort of job, and he looked okay, and you, then you would, you'd answer the question. So he was still entering the movie that way. But you had entree the into prologue. the character. And we said, boy, now his entrance is really flat. Especially after introducing this other character. The, the Goliath character is introduced so amusingly, so entertainingly, and, and the David character, his character had always it had been, even though it had been a flat entrance, it had been intriguing because we had seen him in the prologue, so the audience would have naturally ask, how did he get from there to there while we weren't Literally, eating out of a so trash can to So he said, no, we can't have him come in this flat anymore. He's, he's got to have a more arresting right. entrance into the movie. But it came right out of the job he did. There had been, in the movie, an, 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 an off-camera allusion to something he'd done. Hey, why are you late? Oh, I had to, had to drive somebody somewhere. So he just said, let's, let's depict it. Let, let's make it into something. Let's, let's, let's show him an, an actual so a day worked. at work and how it counterpoints with the day at work of the Goliath character. Whose, whose day is glory. You know, you know who, who just has a wonderful, just show what, how, what this guy has to do to get through a day, and so we, we, you know, we, we built it from 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 the ground up. But uh, you know, it, it was it was to serve a, uh, the need of, of 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 arresting the audience's attention and, and you know getting them to, to to concentrate on this character. Right. You mentioned before um, a, a kind of a setup payoff um, thing with the Tom Hanks character right. in that in that one that scene we discussed. Is there a system for kind of planting setups and payoffs? that works as a separate schematic in the, in the development of the screenplay in terms of like almost like a, you know, a, a line that you just want to establish? No. Or does it come organically as, it in the really, writing? It really, 90% nine, of the time just comes organically. We, we'll, either, we'll either find it from the ace, I will be writing it, and one of us will say, you know, wouldn't it be great if later, ba 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 bum Or it can happen the other way. We're writing a scene and you're going, wouldn't it have been great if back earlier it had been established or understood that blah, blah, blah? You know, I mean, it, it really... Uh, you learned that from uh, I.L. Diamond and Billy Warler. Those are the kings of uh, right. skimming. Why is that so satisfying to an audience member? Like, why am I so satisfied when I see that stuff embedded in it's a like story? It's like a click. It's, it's like when you... When you it's, it's, it's that good click where you're trying to open or close something and you go, yeah, I guess that'll stay, but you didn't hear that nice click. snap, right. you know? You're talking about Wilder and Diamond, that 
That broken mirror broken in the mirror. apartment. Watch the apartment. Uh, you won't. You won't. You not won't be sorry. Guys, guys. And I'm talking to the camera. <laughs> not to the, yeah, I'm guys. not talking to guys working. These guys are barbecuing <laughs> while we're talking here. <laughs> um, uh, you know, they and and like he says, Wilder and Diamond were Master fantastic side, yeah. at, at that sort of thing. It, it, it's uh, it, it it does. I know what you mean. It just it just feels so good when right. it works. Can you mention some specific examples uh, from your own lives that you brought into Parenthood? You mentioned some of of Ron's and and the the, the right at the beginning. I, I had that in the the exact dialogue. I said to my daughter, she felt sick, I was pretty bad, I said, you don't feel good? Do you feel like you'd like to throw up? And she said, okay, and threw up on me. <laughs> you know, she my, thought it was, an, right. it was an offer, an invitation. And in my life, there's the drama. I had my oldest son, Josh, played Little League, wasn't great. You suck, Mandel. That's what I heard. And you go, oh, God, wow. Right. You, know, I, you know, all right. Then you, the beauty about screenwriting, you have the opportunity to have the, the child Pain, and then let him catch the ball. Well, right. that's yeah. It says Mr. Allen wrote it, Daddy Hall. You know how hard it is to make life work, in, you know, in real life. So you try to make it perfect, uh, perfect in art, you know. But I mean, just the funny thing. I was driving my kids back from, you know, dinner one night. My my son started singing the diarrhea song, <laughs> you know, and we had the exact same dialogue exchange. I said, Where'd you learn that? And he said, At camp. I said, oh, That was money well spent. <laughs> and it, you know, it was it was, it was just but hanging everybody, there. Everybody, even Grazer, those photos of Grazer. That's pure yes, Grazer. That, that, the, he, he said, he I'm going to share something with you. Yes. I'm a little embarrassed. Yes, he was he was reticent, but we were all using our lives, and he just said, Okay. I got one maybe you can, you can do something with. And as soon as he said it, the, the scene where Diane Weiss finds the photos of, of Keanu Reeves and, and Martha Plimpton, he said, that happened to me. You know, I said, young and Ed. Ed well, it's going to happen again. I said, it's going to happen again. <laughs> it's going in a movie. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever get in trouble for uh, airing out real life stuff on screen? I was so sure I was going to get in trouble for Parenthood for my extended family. I was so positive that it was just going to create this horrible shit storm. And, and fourth, the fourth child of the sibling of Steve Martin is Larry, the, the ne'er do well. It was so so based on one of my cousins, and I was so sure the whole family was just going to be so angry that I they put they just it, it just went right it just sailed right by. Have you guys ever made a, ch uh, a big change late in the process, either in the writing process or the production process, that's made a big difference to the end product? Um, well, with Fever Pitch, we were forced to. Well, yeah, that was the most obvious one. Yeah. The surreal life events. Yeah, yeah <laughs> because something we had written years ago, all the, the cosmic forces came together. Yeah, while we were in production on Fever the Pitch, Sox the Red Sox won the World winning. Series. So yes. we, we quick. And, and what I remember was like early September, and Pete Farrelly said, you guys should be keep thinking, these guys are right. these guys are going to the series. And they go, what? Are they drunk this early? <laughs> <laughs> Come on! Nobody comes from back well, from the three game Sox, deficit. You Red Sox fans all your life. They haven't kicked the, the optimism out of you it's yet. September you know? five of of of, of two of two thousand. But he kept he kept saying, be thinking about it. Be thinking of what you what you, how you're going to rewrite this if they win the World Series. And and he we did we we started thinking about it. The the instant the, the series was over, we we had we had new pages like within 48 hours. Oh, good for him. Yeah. Kept the faith.